The Shack, Where Tragedy Confronts Eternity, by William Paul Young. Chapter 2, The Gathering Dark. Nothing makes us so lonely as our secrets. Paul Turnier. Sometime during the night, an unexpected Chinook blew through the Willamette Valley, freeing the landscape from the storm's icy grip, except for those things that lay hidden in the deepest shadows. Within 24 hours, it was early summer warm. Max slept late into the morning, one of those dreamless sleeps that seemed to pass in an instant. When he finally crawled off the sofa, he was somewhat charin, charin, ch ch chagrined to see that the ice follies had fizzled out so quickly, but delighted to see Nan and the kids when they showed up less than an hour later. First came the anticipated and considerable scolding for not putting his bloodied mess in the laundry room, followed by an appropriate and satisfying amount of ooing and eyeing that accompanied her examination of his head wound. The attention, Mac pleased, the attention pleased Mac immensely, and Nan soon had him cleaned up, patched up, and fed up. The note, though never far from his mind, was not mentioned. He still didn't know what to think of it, and he didn't want Nan included if it turned out to be some kind of cruel joke. Little distractions like the ice storm were a welcome, although brief respite from the haunting presence of his constant companion, the Great Sadness, as he referred to it. Shortly after the summer that Missy vanished, the great sadness had draped itself around Mac's shoulders like some invisible but almost ta tangibly heavy quilt. The weight of its presence dulled his eyes and stooped his shoulders. Even his efforts to shake it off were exhausting, as if his arms were sewn into the bleak folds of despair, and he had somehow become a part of it. He ate, worked, loved, dreamed, and played in this garment of heaviness, weighed down as if he were wearing a leaden bathrobe, trudging daily through the murky despondency that sucked the color out of everything. At times he could feel the great sadness slowly tightening around his chest and heart like the crushing coils of a constrictor, squeezing liquid from his eyes until he thought there no longer remained a reservoir. Other times he would dream that his feet were stuck in cloying mud as he caught brief glimpses of Missy running down the wooden path ahead of him, her red cotton summer dress gilded with wildflowers flashing among the trees. She was completely oblivious to the dark shadow tracking her from behind, although he frantically tried to scream warnings to her no sound emerged, and he was always too late and too impotent to save her. He would bolt upright in bed, sweat dripping from his tortured body, while waves of nausea and guilt and regret rolled over him like some surreal tidal flood. The story of Missy's disappearance is, unfortunately, not unlike others too often told. It all happened during Labor Day weekend, the summer's last hurrah before another year of school and autumn routines. Mac boldly decided to take the three younger children on a final camping trip to... Wallowa Lake in northeastern Oregon. Nan was already booked at a continuing education class in Seattle, and the two older boys were back at college or counseling at a summer camp. But Mac was confident that he possessed the right combination of outdoorsmanship and mothering skills. After all, Nan had taught him well. The sense of adventure and camping fever gripped everyone, and the place became a whirlwind of activity. If they had done it Mac's way, they would have simply backed a moving van up to the house and shifted most of its contents for the long weekend. At one point in all the confusion, Mac decided he needed a break and settled himself in his daddy chair after shooting off after shooing off Judas, the family cat. He was about to turn on the tube when Missy came running in, holding her little plexiglass box. Can I take my insect collection camping with us? asked Missy. You want to take your bugs along? grunted Mac, not paying her much mind. Daddy, they're not bugs, they're insects. Look, I've got lots of them in here. Mac reluctantly turned his attention to his daughter, who, seeing him focus, started explaining the contents of her treasure box. See, there are two grasshoppers. And see on that leaf, there's my caterpillar. And somewhere, there she is. Do you see my ladybug? And I have a fly in here somewhere too, and some ants. As she inventoried her collection, Mac tried his best to show attention, nodding along. So, Missy finished, can I take them along? Sure you can, honey. Maybe we can let them loose in the wild when we're out there. No, she can't, came a voice from the kitchen. Missy, you need to keep your collection at home, honey. Trust me, they're safer here. Nan stuck her head around the corner and lovingly frowned at Mac as he shrugged his shoulders. I, I tried, honey, he whispered to Missy. Grrr, growled Missy. But knowing the battle was lost, she picked up her box and left. By Thursday night, the van was overloaded and the pull-behind tent trailer hitched up with lights and brakes tested. Early Friday, after one last lecture from Nan to her kids about safety, obedience, brushing teeth in the mornings, not picking up cats with white stripes down their backs, and all manner of other things, they headed out. Nan north up Interstate 205 to Washington, and Mac and the three amigos east on Interstate 84. 
The plan was to return the following Tuesday night, just before the first day of school. The Columbia River Gorge is worth the trip by itself, with breathtaking panoramas overseen by river-carved mesas standing sleepy guard in the late summer warmth. September and October can offer some of Oregon's best weather. Indian summer often sets in around Labor Day and hangs on until Halloween, when it quickly turns cold, wet, and nasty. This year was no exception. Traffic and weather cooperated wonderfully, and the crew hardly noticed the time and miles passing by. The foursome stopped at Multnomah Falls to buy a coloring book and crayons for Missy and two inexpensive waterproof disposable cameras for Kate and Josh. They then decided to climb the short distance of the trail to the bridge facing the falls. There had once been a path that led around the main pool and into a shallow cave behind the tumbling water, but unfortunately, it had been blocked off by the park authorities because of erosion. Missy loved it here, and she begged her daddy to tell the legend of the beautiful Indian maid, the daughter of a chief of the Multnomah tribe. It took some coaxing, but Mac finally relented and retold the story as they all stared up into the mists shrouding the falling cascade. The tale centered on a princess, the only child left to her aging father. The chief loved his daughter dearly and carefully picked out a husband for her, a young warrior chief of the Clatsop tribe whom he knew she loved. The two tribes came together to celebrate the days of the wedding feast, but before it could begin, a terrible sickness began to spread among the men, killing many. The elders and the chiefs met to discuss what they could do about the wasting disease that was quickly decimating their warriors. The oldest medicine man among them spoke of how his own father, when aged and near death, had foretold of a terrible sickness that would kill their men, an illness that could be stopped only if a pure and innocent daughter of a chief would willingly give up her life for her people. In order to fulfill the prophecy, she must voluntarily climb to a cliff above the big river and from there jump to her death onto the rocks below. A dozen young women, all daughters of the various chiefs, were brought before the council. After considerable debate, the elders decided that they could not ask for such a precious sacrifice, especially for a legend they weren't sure was true. But the disease continued to spread unabated among the men, and eventually the young warrior chief, the husband-to-be, fell ill with the sickness. The princess, who loved him, knew in her heart that something had to be done, and after cooling his fever and kissing him softly on the forehead, she slipped away. It took her all night and the next day to reach the place spoken of in the legend, a towering cliff overlooking the big river and the lands beyond. After praying and giving herself to the great spirit, she fulfilled the prophecy by jumping without hesitation to her death on the rocks below. Back at the villages the next morning, those who had been sick arose well and strong. There was great joy and celebration until the young warrior discovered that his beloved bride was missing. As the awareness of what had happened spread rapidly among the people, many began the journey to the place where they knew they would find her. As they silently gathered around her broken body at the base of the cliff, her grief-stricken father cried out to the great spirit, asking that her sacrifice would always be remembered. At that moment, water began to fall from the place where she had jumped, turning into a fine mist that fell at their feet, slowly forming a beautiful pool. Missy usually loved the telling, almost as much as Mac did, It had all the elements of a true redemption story, not unlike the story of Jesus that she knew so well. It centered on a father who loved his only child and a sacrifice foretold by a prophet. Because of love, the child willingly gave up her life to save her betrothed and their tribes from certain death. But on this occasion, Missy didn't say a word when the story was finished. Instead, she immediately turned and headed for the van as if to say, okay, I am done here, let's get going. They made a quick stop for some brunch and a potty break at Hood River, and then got right back on the road, reaching La Grande by early afternoon. Here, they left I-84 and took the Walowa Lake Highway, which would take them the final 72 miles to the town of Joseph. The lake and campground they were headed for were only a few miles beyond Joseph, and after finding their site, they all pitched in and had everything set up in short order, perhaps not exactly the way Nan would have preferred, but functional nonetheless. The first meal was a Phillips family tradition flank steak, marinated in Uncle Joe's secret sauce. For dessert, they ate the brownies Nan had made the night before, topped with the vanilla ice cream they had packed away in dry ice. That evening, as he sat among three laughing children watching one of nature's greatest shows, Mac's heart was suddenly penetrated by unexpected joy. A sunset of brilliant colors and patterns played off the few clouds that had waited in the wings to become central actors in this unique presentation. He was a rich man, he thought to himself, in all the ways that mattered. By the time supper was cleaned up, night had fallen. The deer, routine day visitors and sometimes a serious nuisance, had gone wherever deer go to bed down. 
their shift was picked up by the night troublemakers, raccoons, squirrels, and chipmunks that traveled in roving bands looking for any container left slightly open. The Phillips campers knew this from past experience. The first night they had ever spent in these campgrounds had cost them four dozen Rice Krispies treats, a box of chocolates, and all their peanut butter cookies. Before it got too late, the four went on a short hike away from the campfires and lanterns to a dark and quiet spot where they could lie down and gaze and wonder at the Milky Way, stunning and intense when undiminished by the pollution of city lights. Matt could lie and gaze up into that vastness for hours. It felt so incredibly small yet comfortable with himself. He felt so incredibly small yet comfortable with himself. Of all the places he sensed the presence of God, out here, surrounded by nature and under the stars, was one of the most tangible. He could almost hear the song of worship they sang to their creator, and in his reluctant heart, he joined in as best he could. Then it was back to the campsite, and after several trips to the facilities, Mac tucked the three in turn into the safety and security of their sleeping bags. He prayed briefly with Josh before moving across to where Kate and Missy lay waiting. But when it came Missy's turn to pray, she wanted to talk instead. Daddy, how come she had to die? Mac, it took Mac a moment to figure out who Missy was talking about suddenly realizing that the Multinoma princess must have been on her mind since they had stopped earlier. Honey, she didn't have to die. She chose to die to save her people. They were very sick, and she wanted them to be healed. There was silence, and Mac knew that another question was forming in the darkness. Did it really happen? This time the question was, from Kate, obviously interested in the conversation, did what really happen? Did the Indian princess really die? Is the story true? Mac thought before he spoke. I don't know, Kate. It's a legend, and sometimes legends are stories that teach a lesson. So, did it really happen? Asked Missy. It might have, sweetie. Sometimes legends are built from real stories, things that really happen. Again, silence. Then, so is Jesus dying a legend? Mac could hear the wheels turning in Kate's mind. No, honey, that's a true story. And do you know what? I think the Indian princess story is probably true, too. Mac waited while his girls processed their thoughts. Missy was next to ask, Is the Great Spirit another name for God? You know, Jesus' Papa? Mac smiled in the dark. Obviously, Nan's nightly prayers were having an effect. I would suppose so. It's a good name for God because he is a spirit and he is great. Then how come he's so mean? Ah, here was the question that had been brewing. What do you mean, Missy? Well... The Great Spirit makes the princess jump off the cliff, cliff and makes Jesus die on a cross. That seems pretty mean to me. Mac was stuck. He wasn't sure how to answer. At six and a half years old, Missy was asking questions that wise people had wrestled with for centuries. Sweetheart, Jesus didn't think his daddy was mean. He thought his daddy was full of love and loved him very much. His daddy didn't make him die. Jesus chose to die because he and his daddy love you and me and everyone in the world. He saved us from our sickness, just like the princess. Now came the longest silence, and Mac was beginning to wonder if the girls had fallen asleep. Just as he was about to lean over and kiss them goodnight, a little voice with a noticeable quiver broke into the quiet. Daddy? Yes, honey? Will I ever have to jump off a cliff? Mac's heart broke because he understood what this conversation had really been about. He gathered his little girl into his arms and pulled her close. With his own voice, a little huskier than usual, he gently replied, No, honey, I will never ask you to jump off a cliff. Never, ever, ever. Then God, then will God ever ask me to jump off a cliff? No, Missy, he would never ask you to do anything like that. She snuggled deeper into his arms. Okay, hold me close. Good night, Daddy. I love you. And she was out, drifting deep into a sound sleep with only good and sweet dreams. After a few minutes, Mac placed her gently back in her sleeping bag. You okay, Kate? He whispered as he kissed her goodnight. Yep, she whispered. Daddy? What, sweetheart? She asks good questions, doesn't she? She sure does. She's a special little girl. You both are. Except you're not so little anymore. Now get some sleep. We have a big day ahead of us. Sweet dreams, darling. You too, Daddy. I love you tons. I love you too, with all my heart. Good night. Mac zipped up the trailer and on his way out, blew his nose and wiped away the tears that still remained on his cheeks. He prayed a silent thanks to God 
and then went to brew some coffee.